if yours are right close together, but everybody else is spread out. So uh, today we're going to be talking, continually talking about uh, Abraham following in the footsteps of faith. This is the next to the last message in this series. Has this series of messages spoke to you? Yeah. Has it benefited you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about standing up from before the dead. Standing up from before the dead. There was will be a meeting of the board members immediately following service, the pastor said. After the close of the service, the church board gathered at the back of the sanctuary for the announced meeting. There was a stranger in their midst, a visitor who had never attended church before. My friend, said the pastor, did you understand that this is a meeting of the board? Yes, said the visitor. And after today's sermon, I suppose I'm just about as bored as everyone else who came to the meeting. Meeting of the board. Yeah. I hope that you're not. (laughs) We have had the privilege of walking with Abraham through the peaks and the valleys of the life that he lived. We have seen him leave his homeland and walk with God by faith. We have witnessed his successes and his failures. We have seen him as he has experienced the joy of childbirth and watched as he willingly gave up that child to the will of the Lord. Abraham's life has been filled with the best and the worst that life can dish out. Genesis 22 took this man to the pinnacle of faith and obedience. That chapter takes into the depths of the valley of the shadow of death and here as we watch him say goodbye to his wife Sarah. We see a man who has learned to walk by faith as he weathers the storms of life. Anybody walk through a storm in your life? Yeah. I'm not talking about the rain, the tornado. I'm not talking about those type of storms. I'm talking about the storms that wreak havoc upon our lives. Today I would like to for us to watch Abraham in these verses as he teaches us how to live the life of faith even when tragedy enters our view. I want to talk for a while about standing up from before the dead. So who has Genesis 23, verses 1-20 through 20 is the text, but I've got the passages because it's a lengthy passage that I want you to read. Okay, 1-4 through four first, and then 17-20. through 20. So 1-4, through four, Sarah lived to be 127 years old. She died at Kirith Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Then Abraham arose from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites. He said, I am an alien, a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so I can bury my dead. And then 17 through 20. So Ephron's field and Machpelah near Mamre, both the field and the cave in it, and all the trees within the borders of the field was deeded to Abraham as his property in the presence of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. Afterwards, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which is Hebron in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave in it were deeded to Abraham by the Hittites as a burial site. So in this passage we see that it was a time for farewells. It was a time of sadness and separation. We are told that Abraham's wife of some 70 years has died. This kind of separation is a part of everyone's life. 
But when it comes, we are never quite prepared for the hurt that it brings. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, And inasmuch as it is appointed for man to die once, and after this comes the judgment. Yes. Thank God the cruel messenger of death will be done away with forever. Amen. One day. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Revelation 21 and verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Therefore, there, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor shall there shall be no more pain for the former things that passed away. First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse twenty-six says, "The last enemy that will be abolished is death." So then, there's the sting of sorrow. Anybody ever faced sorrow before? Mm -hmm. What are some things that we usually face when we face sorrow? Uh, hopelessness. Death. Hopelessness. Death. 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 Death of a family member. Mm -hmm. Death of the wise. Family. Why did this happen? All the wise, yeah. the questioning, the yeah. doubt. Why would God allow me to go through this? When death entered the home of Abraham, it broke his heart. The Bible says that he came to mourn and to weep. These words literally mean to wail and to shed tears. By the way, this is a natural reaction to death. Why we react that way, I have no clue. But it's the way God designed it. God designed everything in life. He designed joy and He designed sadness as a part of the emotional makeup of man. We will never know the true joys that come our way unless we experience joy, the sadness of life and grief in life. We will never know the different emotions unless we express and go through the opposite. And it makes the senses heightened even more. There are times when we hear people tell us not to weep over the dead. But when they are stripped from our presence, it is impossible not to weep for and miss them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, this room ever lost somebody? Yeah. Lost yeah. 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 Anybody heard of F.B. Meyer? F.B. Meyer says this, Tears relieve the burning brain as a shower of electric clouds. Tears discharge the insupportable agony of the hearer as an overflow lessens the pressure of the flood against the dam. Tears are the material out of which heaven weaves its brightest rainbows. Mm -hmm. Tears are transmuted into jewels of better life as the wounds of the oyster turn to pearls. Mm -hmm. When death has intruded into the land of the living, do not fear their cleansing needful ministry of, in your life. So then we look at the strength of steadfastness. The Bible tells us that Abraham stood up from before the dead. This means that when the mourning had period was over, Abraham moved on with his life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Too many times we get so <coughs> caught up in a grieving process that we fail to live. <coughs> Life moves mm -hmm. on. And the person that you're grieving for, if they could come up beside you and say something to you, they would tell you to just live. 
Go on with your life. Don't worry about me. You see, grief is a normal part of living. But there is a time when grief must reach an end. Sorrow over death is natural, but sorrow that does not end is unnatural. Yeah. A woman once said that she had grieved for her parents for 25 years. Mm-hmm. Folks, that is a not godly sorrow. We are told in the Bible, but I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That your sorrow not even as others which have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 We may learn to rejoice over our loved ones who, like Sarah, have entered the realms of life. I think we have it backwards sometimes. We need to weep in our day of time for when a child is born. And we need to rejoice when we know our loved one has gone to be in the arms of our Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5 8 says, We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body than to be at home with the Lord. Amen. Amen. One day we will join them there. Amen. Yeah. One day heaven come down and glory will fill my soul. Amen. Yes. It is a time of faithfulness. <laughs> Abraham has been given all the land by the promise of God. However, he does not own one square inch of the land at this point. Right. He goes to speak to the men of the city to acquire a place to bury the dead. And in verse 4 of this passage, we see that Abraham declares his identity. You and I need to declare our identity. Yes. I am not Mike Mayfield. I am a child of the Most High God. Amen. Amen. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes. I am holy because He is holy. Amen. The Bible tells me that as He is, Amen. so I am in this world. Amen. Is He holy? Yes. yes. Is He blameless? Yes. Is He righteous? Yes. yes. And He's coming again one day Amen. to set me free. Amen. Amen. He declares his identity. He tells the men of that city that he is just a pilgrim among them. See, the pilgrims didn't just come to America. (laughs) Abraham was a pilgrim. (laughs) He has lived there for some 62 years at this point. But he has never settled down. He says that he is a newcomer and is just passing through. Yes. (laughs) This is the story of which the wayfaring stranger was written about. Right. Mm-hmm. Even after all this time, he has never set down roots in this world. What a lesson to the children of God. Yes. As long as our roots do not run too deep into this world, we will not become so entangled in the, its affairs. Amen. May we never forget our identity. Yes. Mm-hmm. Who are you? Child of God. Mm-hmm. We are pilgrims and strangers in this world. First yeah. Peter two, verse eleven. That's Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Let us so live and not settle down by keep on traveling, looking for that city, our eternal home, whose builder and maker is God. Amen. 
In verses 4 through 16, we see Abraham demonstrates his integrity. In order to secure a place to bury his wife, Abraham strikes out a deal with one of the sons of, of Heth. I think this is where Meth comes from. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> a man by the name of Ephron. It's not Zach Ephron either. <laughs> Abraham mentions a certain piece of property and Ephron offers to give it to him, but Abraham refuses because he does not want to be indebted to any man as we see in verse 13. This is a good lesson for every child of God that we need to be aware that we owe no man anything but love. Amen. 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 <laughs> Romans 13 verse 8 says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. <laughs> For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Better not buy that new truck. Unless you've got the money to pay for it. <laughs> when Ephron sees that he has the advantage over Abraham, he charges him more than a fair price. But instead, he is standing up for him. Abraham humbly accepts the offer. Having to pay for land that God has promised to give him might have caused many men to stumble. Right. God promised me this land. You're going to give it to me. Yeah. Or God's going to strike you down and I'm going to take it anyway. That's not what happened. Abraham was able to see beyond the present into the future where it was all his anyway. Mm-hmm. Even in trials, Abraham was a man of integrity. Yes. How we conduct ourselves when the pressure is on says more about you than how you act when things are good. Right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's so true. One of the best examples in the Bible of integrity is the pressure that we see in the life of Job. In Job chapter 1, verses 20. 322. Nice. Then Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Despite all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Yes. Take note of, of in all this, as we see in that passage. In verses 17 through 20, it was a time of faith. The fact that Abraham has buried his wife in a cave in Hebron shows the depth of his faith in the Lord God. Of course, Abraham's faith is well known and documented even in the Old Testament as much as it is the New. Hebrews 11, 13-16. Um, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, and thinking that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Yes. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has been very seen for them. I saw, behold, I saw a new Jerusalem yes. coming down out of heaven, 
like a bride again for her husband. Yes. In Abraham's life, we can see faith exhibited in three areas. The first area that I want you to notice is that we see his faith in the promises of God. He was able to buy the cave with confidence, seeing that he already owned the land in trust. It had been given to him by the precious promise of God. So let's look at Genesis 13, 15 through 17. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like dust, dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. <laughs> Go walk through the length and breadth of the land for I am giving it to you. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. He knew that one day that he and his descendants would be buried in this very cave. But he was able by faith to see far beyond this. He was able to see a day when he would stand with Sarah in the presence of the Lord in heaven. Amen. Hebrews 11, 9 and 10 says, By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for a city which found, has foundations whose architect and builder is God. Mm -hmm. This same faith dwelled in the, in the heart of Job. Job 19, 25-27 says, As for me, I know my Redeemer lives, mm -hmm. and at the last He will take His stand upon the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. Mm -hmm. yes. Whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another, my heart faints mm -hmm. within me. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. It shall dwell in our hearts as well. Mm -hmm. Look at John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. <clears throat> and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. Yes. When we're able to look beyond the present to the things we have been given a promise in by faith, it secures the heart, frees the mind, and strengthens the hands to work. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. When we know we are going home someday, it makes the trials of this journey much more bearable. Amen. Yes. So the second way that we see faith operating in Abraham's life is that we see his faith in the plan of God. We see it in the promises, but we see it in the plan. God has a plan. Uh, I just don't know God's plan for my life. Keep living and you'll stumble upon it. <laughs> Sometimes we trip and fall over. <laughs> Abraham knew that even as he buried Sarah here in this cave, there would come a day when his descendants would inherit this land and would dwell here as well. Because of this great knowledge, Abraham was able to endure his grief, his pain, and his losses. He knew God's plan is always best. Amen. So, if, Rick, if we had known what God was going to do with NFCC, 
back when we were in Brian and Rebecca's living room downstairs, I, I think seeing some things, we might want to change some things. We might want to do things differently. But God had a plan all along. And God is continually adding to us people that fit the character of this body. Amen. Yes. Yeah. You know, we're we've called ourselves a group of misfits at times. Yeah. You know, we just don't fit in anywhere else because we fit in here. Right. Amen. But God has a plan, and Abraham has faith in that plan. Romans eight twenty eight. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Yes. Amen. In all things we know that God causes all things to work together for those who love God. Yes. You want to hear the proper translation of what that should read? Mm -hmm. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those that God loves. Yes. Big difference, isn't it? Yeah. Doesn't matter whether you love God, God loves you. Amen. One day at the age of nine, after spending nine years not knowing who God really was, I gave my heart to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I become, I started getting to know Him. But He knew me. Mm -hmm. He knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb. Right. He knew me before I was ever conceived. Amen. And yet He conceived a plan before He said, let there be light. Amen. Mm -hmm. That I would fulfill His purpose. Amen. Thank you. If we could ever grasp a hold of this truth, it would change our lives. Yep. Amen. It would spell the end of our second guessing and worrying about our whys and what ifs. Right. God has a perfect plan and it is not meant to hurt you. Amen. But it is meant to produce His image yes. in your life. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Romans 8.29 for those God foreknew, He also predestined and to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that may, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. Yes. It is meant to glorify His name and further the kingdom in this world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The best thing we can ever do is submit humbly and wholly to what the Lord is doing in and around us. Amen. So the third and final thing that I want us to notice is that when we Abraham, we, we see his faith in the power of God. We see it in the promises. We see it in the plan of God. And now we see it in the power of God. Even as he stared death in the face, Abraham was able to walk in victory because he knew that he was serving a God who controlled all of the affairs of life and death. He knew that even though his pain was great and his loss was terrible, in the end, he would come out a winner because God resides on the throne. Mm -hmm. Would to God we could remember that today. We are not going to be in this world with all of its pain and its heartache forever. The day is coming when we will leave this world for a new home in glory. When that day comes, we will enjoy the victory. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is this. I read the conclusion of this book. Have you read the conclusion? We're studying it on Thursday nights. We have already won all there is to win. We just, might just want to wait until the victory we already hold by faith will be beheld by our eyes. 
There are times when we will look at the impossible situation and wonder how much more can we take? You ever been there? How much more of this can I endure? Let me tell you now that God's grace is sufficient for you in everything you will face in life. Amen. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, and He said this to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. That's... Amen. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Yes. Thank you, Father. How many of you have had weak moments? Okay. How many of you has ever messed up? How many of you have ever talked ugly to your husband or your wife, Cheryl? I don't have a wife, Cheryl. She got her name called because she was late coming in. You know guys. You know guys I'm kidding. But the thing is, is that God says to each one of us, He doesn't just say this to Paul. Here's the, here's the kicker, is that when God was speaking to certain individuals in the Bible, He wasn't speaking just to that individual. He was speaking to each one of us because He has that same message to each one of us. Amen. Okay? Amen. When we mess up, God picks us up and dusts us off. We're the ones that tend to want to lay down. Right. We're the ones that tend to want to wallow around in what we've messed up. Yeah. God says, get up. It's been paid for. I'm dusting you off so that you can continue on your journey by faith. Amen. Amen. He will give you grace to stand from your dead and to go on for His glory until the battle is over. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. I do not know what you might be facing today. But I do know that faith, in faith, where the victory lies. Amen. Yes, thank you, Father. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Amen. Amen. That's us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This, it doesn't say maybe. It doesn't say that if you hang on and pay enough tithes. It doesn't say that if you work hard enough at the church. It doesn't say that if you get along with your neighbor all the time. It doesn't say that if you like your neighbor. It says, for whoever is born of God, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What? Our faith. Amen. Amen. Yes. What will you take? What will it take to get you to stand up from your death? Tough questions that I've asked throughout this message series. Whatever it is, the Lord has got it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So come get it. Amen. Yes. You guys received that word today. Yes. 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 <laughs> Screen, but it's well, I thought. <laughs> There's a song out called oh, Jesus Wrote Me a Letter. There's 66 of them in here, and each and every letter applies to us. Amen. Because Amen. it is all about it. Yes. Oh, how I wish I had a yeah. I'll be the first to admit I don't. I could not kill my son. And he was ready to do it. The knife was in the air. And that's it. Would you have that in faith? On the way up the mountain, you got to remember. Isaac said, where's the lamb or whatever we're going to sacrifice? The Lord said, or Abraham told his son, Isaac. <laughs> the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. And he also said to his servants, We will return. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is remarkable. Amen. That is remarkable. Never give up hope. 
always have faith because these 66 letters will help you deal with any issue you face. Mm -hmm. Cheryl and I went through some really rough times a few years ago that I've been on now. We came home from church. I wasn't feeling good. I thought I had the flu. And it turned out I had a rupture in my blood. More by more than some uh, a artery rupture. I had no idea. I had no pain. I had no nothing. The only thing, I was passing out. Yeah, you were sicker than a dog. Oh, well, yeah. I was sick. But wow. No idea. After we get to the hospital, they did two operations. Uh, the second operation, there were two vascular surgeons in there, and they had both of their hands. So four hands inside my belly trying to fix the problem. Because the first operation didn't work at all. Mm. We got all done with that. And she asked me, how do you feel? I mean, are you all right? Is everything okay? And I'm emotionally. And she goes, I was scared to do it. I said, Cheryl, I love you. Absent from the body is pretty good. Amen. And she just, she got it. Faith, you keep it. Yes, Father. Keep it going. Amen. Thank you, Father. Let's take the meeting together. Are you ready for the meeting?